Obviously, today I am here in Oakland. I'm uh, meeting with you all on Ohlone land. I just want to make um, a, li a little time here to do an acknowledgement of land. Um, we want to acknowledge their ancestors, past and present and future. Um, and we want to take a quick moment to um, acknowledge this space and time that we're all gathered in today. We're hearing some amazing, really great answers in the chat. So we will make sure that we can kind of take a moment to reflect on what literacy and justice means to us all um, as we get things started. So today's the very first virtual session that we have here. We have the amazing Kim Lockhart joining us as a featured um, presenter um, for the symposium. Today's session, practical evidence-based strategies to support second language learners using the science of reading. Um, we'll kick off in just a moment. Um, we also wanna make sure that you don't miss out on any of the upcoming um, sessions, pre-symposium sessions. We're in the thick of things, folks. So tomorrow we have our Right to Read Symposium. There'll be, a, sorry, film, private film screening. There'll be a link in the chat box down below. Um, so feel free to click on that so you can um, register yourself and get more information about the film screening. Um, on Friday, um, the day before the symposium, we have our in conversation session with uh, Lakeisha and uh, Karen D'Souza. Um, make sure that you also click on that link uh, so that you can register yourself and join us as part of those conversations. So without too much further ado, I want to make sure that I take a moment to introduce Kim. Um, Kim is an elementary French immersion student literacy support teacher in Ontario, Ontario, Canada, um, and has a strong and is a strong advocate for students with reading disabilities in second language programs. Kim earned her master's of education degree from Queen's University, where she specialized in instructional practices that support students with reading difficulties in French immersion. In 2019, Kim was awarded one of the 50 most influ influential alumni in 50 years at Queen's Faculty of Education. And I will just hand it right over to Kim now. Thank you. Wow, what a wonderful introduction. Thank you so much, Aaliyah. And hello, everyone from your uh, Northern friends here in uh, Canada. Um, I'm just going to share my screen. Hopefully everything goes as planned. There we go. All right. All right. Well, thank you very much for uh, for inviting me to speak to you today about the science of reading and my experience using a structured literacy approach to ensure equitable access to reading for my second language learners. Um, we have a jam packed session, as you can imagine, there's a lot to cover. So uh, we're going to first do a little overview of the science of reading. What exactly do we mean when we talk about the science of reading? I want to make sure we're all in the same playing field because I think we're coming in with varying degrees of knowledge of what the science of reading is. I'm going to speak to you about a structured literacy approach. I'm also going to um, tell you a little bit about a Canadian success story, and that is the Ontario Human Rights Commission's Right to Read Inquiry. Um, I'm going to do some demonstrations to show you how I put research into practical application in my classroom every day. And then I'm going to show you some next steps on your science of reading learning journey. So you're probably wondering, who is this Kim Lockhart other than uh, a Canadian? So first and foremost, I am a mom of two young girls and they are 10 and 12. I am a teacher with 22 years of classroom teaching experience. I began my teaching career overseas, teaching in Singapore and then France, and then later three years in Monterey, Mexico, where I taught ESL or uh, second language learners in Monterey. And then in 2005, I came to Kingston, Ontario, where I became a French as a second language teacher. I uh, did my master's at Queen's University, focusing on how to support our second language learners with reading difficulties. Um, and I'll get into a little bit more about that. And 
I, through, through my research, I have become a strong advocate for parents and caregivers, helping them to advocate for equitable access to reading supports for their, uh, for their children, not just our second language learners, but for all students with reading difficulties. Um, I did put in here, I don't take no for an answer very well. Um, so we're gonna to talk to you a little bit about the barriers that I have faced. And I'm basically just super passionate about sharing my science of reading learning journey and my practical um, strategies that I use in my classroom. And I am always learning. So would love to hear some strategies from you if we have time at the end where we'll have a Q&A um, in the last 15 minutes. All right, so what is the science of reading? I want to make sure that we're all on similar playing fields and, and, and on the same page when we talk about the science of reading. So the science of reading is a vast interdisciplinary body of scientifically based research. It pulls from various disciplines, including cognitive science, neuroscience, um, psychology, educational science. And there are decades of research to show that the human brain learns to read in a certain way. And we use the science of reading to guide our reading instruction. We want to um, use the science to inform our teaching practices. And we use the science to explain, helps us explain why some students have difficulty reading and how we can most effectively assess, teach, and most importantly, improve student outcomes. Um, now, the science of reading uh, in the past has sometimes been kept in a bit of a silo in the in the universities and the faculties and hasn't made its way into um, teachers colleges. So what I'm trying to help do today is show how we can bridge that science of reading that is sometimes self contained in the in the uh, disciplines of neuroscience and cognitive science and show you what that looks like in practical applications in the classroom. Um, also, for each slide, I've tried to create a bit of a source, so if you want to do a deeper dive into the science of reading or into each one of the topics, um, you can do so. I will be sharing my slides at the end of the presentation. So I'd like to start with um, the simple view of reading model. The simple view of reading is essentially like a mathematical equation. If we're thinking about reading and our desired outcomes for our students, we want our students to be able to comprehend what they read. In order for our students to have reading comprehension or the ability to make meaning from print, our students need two things. And like a multiplication uh, equation, if we have one times zero, our product will be zero. So we must have both components here in order for students to comprehend what they read. One without the other will receive a zero. So uh, looking at the decoding and word recognition um, box here, decoding is the idea that we're peeling sounds off the page, that the students are essentially decoding. They are taking a look at the letters and they are associating sounds with those letters and they're blending those sounds together and they're reading words. That is essentially what word recognition is. Language comprehension, on the other hand, is the understanding of spoken language. That is understanding vocabulary, the meaning behind those sounds that students are reading. So if we have a, a, a child who can decode, who is sounding like a good reader, but they can't understand what they're reading, they are never going to comprehend what they're reading. Similarly, often students with reading disabilities, such as dyslexia, struggle with the word recognition piece. They struggle to um, make those letter sound associations. They, they have difficulties blending those sounds together to, to read the words off the page, but they may have very strong language comprehension. So when read aloud, they can understand the meaning of text. They just can't simply um, read the words themselves. So a, a, an example that I used when I lived in uh, Mexico, um, Spanish is a very phonemic language. So I was able to decode beautifully. The problem is I had no idea what I was reading. I wasn't able to attach meaning to those words that I was reading. So when I went home for the holidays, I was decoding um, 
uh, a letter that had been written to me in Spanish. And my father said, oh, Kimberly, you're a beautiful reader. What are you reading? I said, I actually have no idea. I was a beautiful decoder, but I had no language comprehension. So we want to make sure that our students are um, getting instruction in both areas in order to um, comprehend and be strong, proficient readers. So if we take a look at the simple view of reading and we tease it out and we dissect it even further, we have Scarborough's Reading Rope. And Scarborough's Reading Rope was developed um, back in 2001. So we're looking at 21 years ago. This is not new, folks. This has been around for over 20 years. And if you think about that left box there, that um, word recognition or that decoding piece that can be further teased out into three different strands of the reading rope and that's at the bottom of Scarborough's reading rope that includes phonological awareness which is the larger units of words so we're talking about syllables and base words and prefixes and suffixes and um, those larger units of words um, we're also looking at decoding, which is that letter sound correspondence. And you may hear me say grapheme phoneme correspondence. And by grapheme, I mean the letter or the symbol and phoneme is the sound. So the phoneme is the sound that is corresponded with the letter. And then of course we have to have automaticity. Students can't just struggle to decode the words. They have to be able to read them automatically. So that is a big component of that word recognition piece. Now, the other component of the simple view of reading is the language comprehension. And the language comprehension is something I think we naturally do as teachers quite well. I think with our read alouds and rich texts and culturally responsive literature, we're able to build the students' vocabulary. We talk about sentence structure. We talk about grammar. So what I'm going to be focusing on mostly today is that word recognition piece helping students understand that these words are made up of individual sounds and knowing that sound correspondence because it's very different for our, our uh, English second language learners. So we're gonna be focusing on the majority on the word recognition. So what exactly do I mean by structured literacy? Well, the science of reading is the what. It is the, the, the research behind how the brain learns to read, whereas structured literacy is the how. It's the approach that we use in our classrooms. And structured literacy is defined as a comprehensive approach to reading instruction that I'm just going to move that up a little bit, um, that research has shown is effective for all students and it's essential for students with reading disabilities. So it is um, defined as being um, with four characteristics. It is explicit. That means it is not student directed. It is teacher directed. Explicit means I am modeling all the time. I am modeling, I am showing, I am demonstrating, and I'm doing it over and over and over again. Systematic means that we have systems in place. We have routines. We have routines within the routines. And I'm going to show you what some of those routines are. But also it's sequential. And by sequential, I mean, we're not just throwing out a little bit of phonics here, a little bit of phonics there. We're starting with the simplest sounds, letter sound correspondence, and we're moving towards the more complex ones. So we're looking at a, a sequence. And so you may hear the term scope and sequence, and that ensures that we are um, starting our students from the easiest skills and gradually progressing to the more complex skills. It's also diagnostic. By diagnostic, I mean, we're looking at our students. We are constantly screening them, looking for our students who may be at risk of future reading difficulties and catching them before they fall. And this piece is so important because we don't want to take a wait to fail approach. We want to do some diagnoses, some screening as quickly as possible, as young as kindergarten, Find those students who are at risk for reading difficulties in the future and start those interventions and that remediation immediately and not let them um, not take a wait to fail approach until they struggle. All right, so why? Why do I use a structured literacy approach? Well, research shows that a structured literacy approach is essential for 10 to 15% of students across all classrooms in my province of Ontario, across Canada, across your country of the United States. 
up to 15% of our students may never read without a structured literacy approach. 40 to 50% of students, it's necessary. They need some explicit systematic instruction, maybe not the frequent repetitions, maybe not the intensity of our dyslexic learners, but they still need an explicit systematic approach that teaches the sound scale correspondence of letters. But the beauty of a structured literacy approach is it's not harmful to anyone. It is beneficial for all students. So my own two daughters who are 10 and 12, they do not have reading difficulties. They somehow fell in that 5% and learned to read almost but through osmosis. But they can benefit from a structured literacy approach because they don't know the rules um, that they have implicitly learned. So that explicit instruction helps them understand the rules that they have somehow just sort of learned through osmosis, but then it helps them apply it to new and unfamiliar words. And this is a great um, infographic that Kareem Weaver created. Um, it's also based on Nancy Young's uh, Ladder of Reading. Love it. So why? Why do I use a structured literacy approach? I love this infographic because it encompasses my passion and the reason why I use a structured literacy approach in my main classroom with all 29 of my students in kindergarten. It is like the ramp. It provides access to all of my students. Whereas a balanced literacy approach or um, a traditional whole language approach may only work for 60, 65% of my students, leaving what I used to think 40% of my students were spec ed students. So by using a structured literacy approach, I no longer have 35 to 40% of my students falling behind and not feeling like I know what to do about it. So I'm able to sort of cast a net over all of my students, ensure they are all getting the foundational reading skills they need so that they can all um, be successful readers. Are they all learning at the same pace and at the same time? Absolutely not. But if we're talking equity, it makes sense to instruct reading in a way that works for all learners. In 2019, here in Ontario, um, which is our country's biggest province, not geographically biggest province, but population-wise biggest province, the Ontario Human Rights Commission launched an inquiry into school boards and faculties of education or teachers colleges across the province to investigate how reading was being taught. The inquiry fo focused on that word level reading. So what I was talking about in the simple view of reading, the um, decoding piece, they focused on whether or not teachers were using the evidence to teach the word level reading skills to their students. And essentially, they came to the conclusion that Ontario is not meeting its obligations to meet students' right to read, and they are failing in their ability to meet the needs of students with reading disabilities. So on October, um, February 28, 2022, the Ontario Human Rights Commission uh, released the final report and said Ontario is failing in its promise to meet students' human right to read. So this is something that I made up here. It, I call it the backwards design of reading instruction. And if you think about the way we previously taught reading, the first thing we always start with are books. We're told as teachers, read, 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 and eventually our students will pick it up. But I was learning very quickly that even though I was reading aloud all the time to my students and they were building their vocabulary and they enjoyed reading and it gave them their, that love of reading, they still could not for themselves read a book. So I started to dissect books a little bit. And I thought before we can have the, our students, before we give our students a book, we have to show them how to read a sentence because Books are made up of sentences, but before they can read a sentence, they have to be able to read words. Before they can read a word, they have to be able to read the units in a word. But before they can read those syllables, they have to know those letter sound correspondences. And then this may be something that you're finding true after the pandemic and all, after all that mask wearing, students have to be able to correctly pronounce the sounds in syllables and words. And that is 
The oral language is the foundation of the reading process. We must make sure that our students can say the words so that they have that strong oral language foundation as they progress to reading books. So there are six key elements to a structured literacy approach. The first is uh, phonological and phonemic awareness. The second is phonics. The third is fluency, um, vocabulary, listening and reading comprehension and written expression. For the sake of time, I'm not going to be able to do a deep dive into all six elements. So I'm going to focus today primarily on um, the uh, practical applications of phonemic awareness and phonics, and also how do we tie in that vocabulary piece for our second language learners who are coming into the classroom without any vocabulary. So I'm just going to see if I can make that a little smaller. There we go. So this is me in my classroom and um, I'm holding my throat. And the reason I'm, I've got my fingers on my throat is to show my students how our vocal cords are turned on and off for certain sounds. We have many different sounds where our mouth is shaped the same way. For example, the sound and the sound my mouth, my lips, my tongue, they're doing the same thing. The only difference between some sounds is my vocal cords are turned on, such as and my vocal cords are turned off, such as same with and there are many different sounds. So one way that we can teach students how to turn the vocal cords on and off is by feeling the vibrations on their throat. I also use mirrors to show students what my teeth, mouth, and tongue are doing. There are many sounds that sound similar. For example, mm and n, mm, but a mutt is very different than a nut. So we wanna make sure that our students can, can articulate, they can pronounce the sounds, because if they can't, it's going to um, make their oral communication very challenging. And we want to make sure our students are able to pronounce the sounds correctly, um, especially for our second language learners, where some sounds are brand new, and they may not be able to automatically pr produce the sound, especially if we're wearing masks and they can't see what our mouths are doing. So for our second language learners, especially with those sounds that are not familiar in their native language, we want to make sure that we show them what our teeth, mouth, and tongue, and what our vocal cords are doing. Mirrors are a great way to do that. And as you can see, I lowered, I lowered my mask. Louisa Motes is one of my favorite researchers. She is incredible. She wrote the book Speech to Print. Um, here she says, phonemic awareness instruction when linked to systematic decoding and spelling instruction is key to preventing reading failure in children who come to school without these prerequisite skills. I like this quote because it focuses on prevention before intervention. Let's not wait until our students are are failing. Let's not wait until they have fallen so far behind to put in interventions. Let's put those interventions in right away and give our students the, the supports they need so that we can prevent reading failure. So one of the aspects of phonological awareness is understanding that sentences are made up of words. And word awareness is the ability to hear a sentence and understand it's made up of single words and knowing where those words begin and end. Students must have an awareness of spoken words. And one way that I do this is, as you can see, I have a read aloud and I have read aloud the story, but then we chop those sentences into individual words. And everything I do, I do it explicitly. I use an I do, we do, you do model. So I am modeling, modeling, modeling. So this is a French lesson that I used. And so je vois un canard. If you are not familiar with French, that might all sound like one stream of sounds. So I show the students by chopping on my hand, je is one word, voix, un, canard. And then I turn to the page to show them the vocabulary word I'm talking about. This here is un oiseau. So the red bird, I would do je, voix, see, un, 
was o. So I'm essentially chopping that sentence into individual words. So students begin to hear the words, but also start to attach meaning to those words. Because for my FSL learners, like your um, English second language learners, they may not be able to differentiate one word from two words or three words all squished together. So we want to make sure that we are cutting up and, 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 and isolating those individual uh, words for them. Sometimes we count on our fingers, but I find sometimes with our little ones, like this little guy here is only three and a half. And so um, it gets very confusing counting on the fingers. So we do that, that chopping action. Syllable awareness. A syllable is a unit, is an individual unit of pronunciation, of pronunciation having one vowel sound that forms a part of a word. And here I am in my classroom and we are hopping syllables and words. Now, if you ask students to hop a syllable in a word and they don't understand what a syllable is, you're just going to get kids hopping up and down aimlessly. So I show them what I mean by syllables. And I show them that when we say a word in an exaggerated form, our mouth opens for each syllable. So rather than having the students clap syllables, I have them put their hand under their chin and they exaggerate the word. For example, the word butterfly, I go butterfly. And it has three syllables. And I know it has three syllables because every time my mouth opens for a vowel sound, my chin hits my hand. So that helps the students count the syllables. Once they've mastered and once I've modeled how we count syllables, we do various full body activities. And one of them is on a hopscotch. So we start with their names. This is Madison. So we counted the syllables in the word Madison, Madison. And she's got three syllables. So she is hopping the syllables in her name. And she's starting to understand that her name Madison is actually individual units of sound. So that's what we're trying to bring their attention to. Rhyming. Now this is a Dr. Seuss book that has been translated into French, but we know that Dr. Seuss is the king of rhyming, nonsense words as well as real words. And rhyming is the repetition of middle sounds and ending sounds. It's not just ending sounds because that would be the, the single unit of sound. It is the middle and ending sounds such as fun, run, sun. Why is rhyming important? It's important because we need students to listen closely to sounds and understand that the word fun is different than run and the word dog is very different than bog. So that one unit of sound the beginning sound can drastically change the meaning of a word. So I use a lot of Dr. Seuss read alouds in French as well as English. And I really wanna bring their attention to those ending sounds. I always use an I do, we do, you do. And rhyming can be broken down into three different ways. I want them to be able to give me a thumbs up if the words rhyme. I might, might say, boys and girls, thumbs up if these words rhyme, chair, hair. So I'm giving them rhyming words. I start with that. I want to give them rhyming words before I ask them to provide a rhyming word for me. Secondly is rhyme generation. Give me a word that rhymes with fish. So by now they understand that it's middle and ending sounds. So they might say wish, they might say dish, or they might say gish which is not a real word. But for our second language learners, they may not know yet the nonsense words from the real word. We are not, this is not a vocabulary lesson. That will be later. But if they say gish rhymes with wish, you can say it absolutely does. It's not a real word, but you generated a rhyming word because they are now able to identify the beginning and, and ending sounds. And that was the task that you asked them to do. And then of course there's rhyme categorization. I'm gonna give you three words, two words rhyme, tell me which word does not. So three different fun ways to work on rhyming. Beginning sounds is the individual unit of sound. So now we're getting, the tasks are becoming more complex because the syllable, the word counting, the syllables, the rhyming, we're looking at units of words. Now we're looking at the individual units of sound. We want our students to hear. 
the beginning sound in words. And we've got um, some pictures here all in French because we are a French second language school. And we want our students to hear the first sound in spoken words because it helps draw their attention to the fact that words are made up of individual sounds. We use the I do, we do, you do gradual release model. And again, we want students to be able to generate words with beginning, similar beginning sounds. We want them to identify beginning sounds. My name is Madame Lockhart. What's the first sound you hear in Lockhart? And I really draw out that beginning sound. Another piece that's really important when you're talking about beginning sounds is using continuous sounds. Rather than starting with a word like table, where the t is a stop sound, you can't stretch it out. It's a stop sound or um, uh, fish. That is a continuous sound. So you can stretch that out. Students who have a difficult time identifying those beginning sounds, you want to start with words that have that stretchy or continuous beginning sound so that they can hear it and draw it out. This is an indicator. Um, these sound skills are an indicator of students who may be at risk of reading difficulties. Students with dyslexia have a hard time discriminating the individual units of sound in words. So some students may pick it up immediately and other students may struggle with it. And you want to keep your eye on that because not being able to identify beginning sounds could be an indicator that you, that student may be at risk of uh, future reading difficulties. Blending. Blending is the precursor to the reading process. Blending is an essential skill for reading. We want our students to have the ability to build words from individual units of sound by blending those sounds together orally. So again, I use the I do, we do, you do. I use tap, tap, slide, and I play a game called, in French, it's mot mystère or mystery word. So I'm going to give you a mystery word and you tell me what that mystery word is. I'm going to start with a continuous sound because that will make things easier for you. Here's the word. S -at. I'm going to say it again. S -at. What's the mystery word? Sat. Very good. It could be a little bit harder if I use a stop sound such as p at. I can't, can, I can't slide that p because it's a stop sound. So you're, you may find that your students have a harder time with the stop sounds when blending the p at. So you wanna start with those continuous sounds and gradually build again from easiest to more complex skills. Segmenting. So segmenting is the precursor or the essential skill for encoding or spelling. So our students, um, at my school, we use an abacus and we often think of an abacus as something we use in mathematics, but I love using an abacus to help the students separate those individual units of sound. And this is one of my um, little friends here who I see every single day for 30 minutes a day and that's still not enough. Um, she has a very hard time hearing the individual units of sound. So we use the abacus and I use the I do, we do, you do model. So I would say, Bella, can you separate or segment the sounds in the word cat? Watch Madame. K -a -t. Now let's do it together. And on her abacus, on her abacus and on my abacus, we're going to do it together. K -a -t. Now do it on your own. And I'm going to, I want to see if she can do the k at. If she does that successfully, I'm going to give her a word that's similar. I'm not going to throw out a word with five sounds in it. I'm going to give her something similar, such as mat. Can you segment the word mat? M at. I'm going to see if she can do that independently. If that is too much, I would go back and do a word with two sounds because again we want to start with the simpler uh tasks and move to the more complex so i would start with b oh, i see a bumblebee can you segment the sounds in the word b b e what about me m e what about c s 
E. And if two sounds is too easy, then I move it, I bump it up, and I do a word with three sounds, a word with four sounds, and a word with five sounds, because that is essentially what spelling is, is the separation of those sounds and um, encoding or spelling. Phonics. So phonic is, phonics is the link between sound, symbol, and meaning, and must be constructed like a layer cake. And here I am with a couple of uh, strategies that I use in, in my uh, classroom with my teaching partners who are uh, fabulous and phenomenal. So decoding, when students have mastered a few sounds, we want them to be able to start blending immediately. So I use, <clears throat> for our sequential instruction, I use something called code packs. I'm just going to um, change my screen so I can make sure that you can see me. So a code pack is essentially recipe cards with the letters or the graphemes in the English alphabet. So we have 26 letters in the English alphabet. However, we have 44 sounds. So we have obviously more sounds than we do letters. And we need to explicitly teach students the sounds that are represented by the letters. So we want students to be able to hear that sound correctly and know that it, it is represented with the letter V. And one way I do that is with a code pack. And I always start with the vowels because we cannot start reading until we have uh, learned our vowel sounds. So I would introduce the vowel. I'd say, this is the letter A. It says the sound ah. Can you repeat after me? And I would have them say ah. I say, that's right. Can you think of a word with the sound ah? Because I want to bring their attention to it. And they might say apple or avenue or something else. And I say, that's right. That is the sound ah. What does it look like? Let's draw it together. And we would draw it in the sky because I, again, want to make sure that they understand that it, it's a sound. It's a visual, but it's something that we can also create. It's that kinesthetic. So I would say, this is the letter A. It says ah. And they would say ah and say, let's write the sound ah. And they would repeat it and um, write it in the sky. This is the letter E, it says E, eh, such as Eddie and Echo. Can you think of another word that starts with E? Eh? And so they would try and generate some, some words that, um, that have the E eh sound in it. We also know that this has other sounds, but we're only teaching the short vowel sounds right now. And I'd say, let's draw E. Eh. And I would go through my code pack. This is the letter I, it says I, like itchy, itchy, I, I, I. And I would have the student do the action because that's a good way for them to remember it, itchy. So if they're across the room, it's like, madam, what does I look like? And I'll go, remember? And then they're like, oh yeah, key word is itchy. And then that brings their attention to the I sound. And then once I go through my vowels, I introduce the consonants and I would do this over the course of a few weeks. I would not obviously inundate them with all of these at the same time. This is the letter B, it's B. Can you repeat B? And we wanna make sure that they're not saying B because when they're reading the word B-A-B-Y, we don't want them to go B-A-B, B-A-B. I don't know what is a B-A-B. We wanna snip it, it's called a schwa. And so we just want a nice clean B. And if they say B, then I just do the snippet B. And then eventually what we're able to do is we're able to make some short, um, uh, well, with the short vowel sounds, we're able to make some syllables. And eventually what we want to do is a visual drill. We wanna go through our code pack. I wanna show them the grapheme and have them automatically tell me what the phoneme is. Ah, eh, I, ah, uh, oh, that's French, sorry. B, k, d, f. So I want them to be able to automatically um, tell me the the sound for that for that letter. That's a code pack. Um, this approach to uh, reading instruction it originated from the Orton Gillingham approach, which was founded by Anna uh, Gillingham, I believe. Anna, sorry. Uh, 
Orton Gillingham back in the 1930s. And I have adapted it for my FSL learners. Um, of course, OI does exist in, in English as well, but um, this is my FSL classroom. Another way that I teach um, the sound symbol correspondence is I have something that I call a flip book and I have all of our vowel sounds and consonants on different colored cards. And we can review it um, as a whole class. And then when I see my most struggling readers, I can pull them aside and work with them in small groups. So this is how I build my decodable text. Now these ones here are in French, but you can do the exact same thing in English. I have my envelopes that have the syllables, and then I use the syllables to build words, and then we use our words to build sentences. And then before we know it, our students are reading these decodable sentences and there are no surprises in these sentences. These have only the vowel sounds, the consonant sounds and the code that I have explicitly taught and that they have consolidated. So we want to make sure, or I want to make sure in my structured literacy program that I um, have them practicing text only with the code that they have been taught. I don't want them guessing, and I certainly don't want them looking at pictures and guessing what a word may be. And I have noticed that, um, and you may notice too, that our three cueing balanced literacy approach that encourages students to look at the pictures and guess the words does not work for our second language learners because they may not have the vocabulary to actually guess the words and pictures. So we wanna make sure when our students are reading and when we are teaching them strategies, those strategies always are looking at the text and not looking at the pictures to guess the words. So here's a, I use, um, uh, the flip book in my whole classroom here. You can see that I've got a couple of engaged students and one who looks like he's nodding off and falling asleep. Now he's someone who maybe he had a bad night last night, maybe he hasn't had a snack, but I know that he's not getting the I'm not getting the engagement from him that I need. So I may pull him in and bring him into my small group. So this is my um, teaching assistant. Um, if Nick isn't teaching at the table, then I would be teaching at the table just to make sure that um, those students who need additional repetition are getting it. And some may need that additional repetition and that more intensive instruction three, four, 30, 40 times. Um, so the, the flip book is a great way to um, teach the, the whole classroom, but also to reinforce some of those strategies in small groups. Vocabulary. So Natalie Wexler, she wrote The Knowledge Gap, and she states that the most important factor in determining whether readers can understand a text is how much relevant vocabulary or background knowledge they have. And this is a photo of one of the teachers at my school, and she's teaching the kindergarten class a vocabulary lesson in her science um, lesson. So she's actually teaching them about science and um, uh, it's the life cycle of the frog. And because these are FSL or French second language learners, they don't have the vocabulary even for the word frog. So she is explicitly systematically teaching them the vocabulary they need to understand the life cycle. But then when they become readers themselves, they're going to have that bank of words in their brain. So when they read the word grenouille, they can say, oh, that word means frog. So we want to make sure that we are incorporating explicit, systematic vocabulary instruction across all subjects, even mathematics, even science, even social studies and history. They lend themselves to really rich vocabulary opportunities. And we want to make sure for our second language learners that we are really building that bank of vocabulary words, or what I call is the mental dictionary, so that when they do read, they have that language comprehension piece and they are not just decoding. Very quickly, the Matthew effect essentially is the idea that students who come from vocabulary rich homes or, or homes where there is a lot of oral language 
come in at an advantage. And that advantage helps them become more proficient readers because they can understand what they're reading. They can understand what is being read to them aloud. Whereas our students who do not come from oral language rich homes, who may not come from uh, homes where the parents read to them or there are in rich engaging conversations, we need to make sure that we are building that vocabulary in our classroom as much as possible because students who come with higher uh, number of vocabulary words are going to um, uh, progress at a more quick rate, at a faster rate than our students who come in um, with less vocabulary. Again, Natalie Wexler says, knowledge like Velcro sticks best when related to other knowledge. So we want to make sure that we are building that background knowledge. And one great way to do that is through the other subjects. And in this um, class, this was actually a visual arts class. And I turned this visual arts class into a structured literacy lesson. We talked about the beginning sounds at the um, start of each vocabulary word. We talked about the syllables. We counted the syllables. But more importantly, I wanted them to know those vocabulary words. And then we did a, a, a read aloud. I read them the story in French. I had done the vocabulary lesson first, so it doesn't just sound like wah, wah, wah when I'm reading to them. They have explicitly been taught that vocabulary. I have that visual reminder on my board when I say in balin. They see the whale there and they then can understand a little bit more about what I'm reading. And then of course we did a, a fun activity because it was a, a visual arts class. So one important, extremely important characteristic of structured literacy is the use of decodable text. And decodable text can also be called controlled text because we control the code. We are controlling what letters and what sounds are presented in the text that our students are reading. Decodable texts often are not really picture heavy because we don't want our students looking at the pictures and guessing the words. We want their eyes on the text and we want to make sure that the text is phonetically decodable. It excludes code that hasn't been taught and we don't want to set up our students for any surprises. We want to set them up for success. However, most of our schools have something called leveled books and leveled books rely on predictable sentence structure. And I know we've all got these books in our classrooms. We've all seen these books at um, Barnes and Noble or Chapters and in Indigo in all the bookstores. We have those leveled readers because um, they're very well marketed and students can look like they're reading. But as soon as those pictures are taken away, all of a sudden we've taken away that strategy that we have essentially taught our students to use looking at the pictures. So what we want to do is we wanna make sure that when they get to grade three and grade four and those pictures are no longer there anymore, that they can actually read the words and they are not relying on the pictures to guess. And as I said before, our second language learners are not benefiting from those pictures if they don't know the word. For example, I have read, and if they look at that picture and they, in French it's poivron, but if they don't know the word peppers in English, if that word isn't in their mental dictionary, they're never gonna, the picture is not gonna be very helpful. We want them looking at the code, we want them sounding out the word, and then once they read the word, they can use the picture to reaffirm what that is and make meaning from it, but not the other way around. So fluency is essentially like the bridge between decoding and reading comprehension. Fluent readers are those who are no longer struggling to pull or peel those words off the page. They're looking at the symbols and they can read those symbols automatically. They can look at a word and they have reached automaticity. Once a student has reached automaticity with their decoding, they can then read for meaning. And that's why we need to focus explicit instruction on reading fluency so that our students can move their cognitive load from decoding the words or essentially sounding out words, you know, sound by sound, which can be very painful and is extremely draining. 
And if all of that energy is trying to peel the sounds off the page, they are not going to have enough energy left or enough of their brain power left to be reading for meaning. So we want to, our students to be reading fluently, which sounds like they're reading effortlessly. They're reading with expression because they're recognizing those words automatically. And that only comes with repeated practice, explicit instruction, and phrasing, showing our students how to phrase. Handwriting, I'm just going to check for time. Handwriting is just as important to the science of reading puzzle as, as decoding. We want to make sure that our students are able to form their letters correctly and form their letters legibly. So one way that we do this, or one thing that a lot of people don't realize is that when students are exploring letter creation or letter formation, that it can often confuse them when it comes to decoding. So we want to make sure when we're showing them to, how to print, they are moving in a left to right direction because that is reinforcing directionality. We read from left to right. So when we print our letters, our letters all move in a left to right direction. So if they're printing the letter um, B and they do the circle, and then they do the line, they're actually moving in the wrong direction. So we want to show them that the letter B starts with the bat and then the ball. And the letter D starts with the magic C and then goes up and down. And by printing the letters B and D differently, that differentiation, that differentiated instruction and that different kinesthetic movement helps them differentiate the B and the D when they're reading it. They'll start to see that letter C in the D. And we again use that, I do it, we do it, you do it, and I correct them immediately. If they go back to those incorrect uh, letter formations, I give them immediate feedback because we want to break those habits. Encoding is essentially spelling. And the way I teach spelling is through something called SOS spelling. And SOS spelling is essentially an easy process that you can use for your FS or your second language learners. I will say a word such as uh, dog. You can talk about what a dog is. And then I say, repeat the word dog because I want to make sure that they're saying d og, dog, and not bog. And then I would say, okay, repeat this word dog. What sounds do you hear in dog? D, a, g. And then I would have them write three lines for each sound. And then I would say, what, which letter says d? And then they would write d. Which letter says a? Which letter says g? Read it back to me. D, a, g, dog and they would check. So that is um, encoding or, or spelling. And that is um, sort of like the seesaw approach. It, it shows um, the importance of understanding and hearing those individual units of sound. So how do we put it all together? Um, essentially, I just walked you through a 60 minute structured literacy lesson plan. We do the visual drill. All of, all of my structured literacy lessons start with the visual drill, with the code pack, and then I do the auditory drill where I will say the sound and the student has to write the letter and that prepares them for that encoding that I just talked to you about. And then we do some blending drills with our flip book and we start blending sounds, we start segmenting with our abacus because I want to make sure that they have consolidated those skills. And then I introduce a new skill. It might be a new sound. For example, oi. I might introduce the new sound. So up till now, it's all been a lot of review. And then we go into that controlled text. I want them reading only the sounds that they have learned. And then we do the encoding practice because we want to make sure that our students are not just good readers, but we need them to be good writers as well. Um, family connections. As a second language teacher, I often have families say, I can't help my child because I don't speak the language of instruction. So what I try to do is help parents understand that sound skills are cross-linguistic. 
sound skills transfer across languages. So in French, I might say, what's the first sound you hear in the word chien, which is dog. But at home, the, the parrot might say, what's the first sound you hear in the word dog? And if the child can isolate the d in dog, they can probably isolate the sh in chien. So we want to make sure we try and connect parents to the learning that's going on at home because it helps parents feel involved and engaged and it strengthens um, that those family um, learning connections. I have a choice board here. Sound skills are cross-linguistic. This is a phonological awareness choice board that I made that I am happy to share. And in terms of next steps, there are so many great courses out there. Um, many are for free. I am currently a literacy coach for the International Dysle Dyslexia Association of Ontario, and I teach an introduction to structured literacy course. There are some great courses on the Keys to Literacy um, website. And the IDA of Ontario has some amazing webinars that are free for anyone who is interested in learning more about structured literacy. There are two books that I highly recommend all second language teachers read. They are phenomenal and a must have. The first one is called Focus on Reading. And the second one is Literacy Foundations for um, English Learners. And um, both books are very uh, research-based, but also have practical applications because who has time to read a book that doesn't have practical applications? <laughs> there are some great podcasts to listen to on the science of reading. I have done one for Melissa and Lori Love Literacy on the right to read. And it talks about how using a structured literacy approach ensures that we get more students reading and we don't leave uh, struggling readers behind. I also started a science of reading book club. And so these are my uh, top recommendations if you are interested in starting a science of reading book club. And I just want to say another huge thank you for, for having me here today. I, uh, I'm sorry it was so jam packed. I, I would love to do a deeper dive into all the different elements of the reading process, but I want to thank you for inviting me here from Canada. And I'm very excited to say I'm actually flying out tomorrow. So hopefully I'll get to see everybody in person on Saturday. Thank you. Thank you so much, Kim. Thank you. Do not apologize for that presentation. Um, I just want to, um, obviously we'll get into some, some other um, questions. We'll, we'll get into uh, some questions right now. I think some folks may be dropping their questions in the chat. That's the place to do that. Um, but before we get into that, I want to say thank you. Um, I know that you are generously offering to share slides and resources after this. So please don't feel frazzled, folks. We'll make sure that you get all this amazing information and content um, after this session. Um, so uh, we can get right started. We can jump into questions, Kim, if you're okay with that. Um, the first question uh, that I picked up here is, in which order do you teach consonants? And folks, keep them coming um, and we'll try and get through as many as we can. So that's a great question. It depends on which program you use, which um, th there, there is no perfect open sequence out there. I'll be honest, I start with the consonants that are the same in English as they are in French, because we want to try and capitalize on our second language learners um, native language as much as we can or home language as much as we can. So I also start with continuous sounds. So I'll start with s and m mm and r er er and uh, those, 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 I call them stretchy sounds, but those continuous sounds because they're easy to, easier to blend. Um, and I always, uh, I do follow a different scope and sequence because I teach French as a second language. Whereas I know for English, um, the University of Florida's new phonics resource, UFLY has a brilliant scope and sequence and it's available for free online. Great, hopefully that answers your question, Elizabeth. Um, 
Tyler, I think I'm trying to pull out a question um, from, from your uh, comment here. Um, and I'm, I'm thinking that it's related to any program specific to teaching this kind of material that you might be able to recommend. So I am hesitant. Well, first of all, I'm hesitant to recommend any program because programs are not perfect. Um, so I very much advocate for teacher knowledge first, teacher training, knowing how to use those programs. Um, I have yet to find a program that doesn't have some errors in it. And you have to use teacher judgment too. You have to know your students. And if you're relying on the program to teach your students, then there's a problem. We need the program to support teacher knowledge of how students learn to read. So um, it's actually my, my pin tweet that, you know, there is no program out there for the science of reading. There is no structured literacy program per se. Structured literacy is composed of all of these elements. And you may find a phonics program that helps support your structured literacy approach, such as the UFLY one that I just recommended um, from the University of Florida. You may choose Hegarty to support your phonemic awareness program, or you may choose um, Dr. Kilpatrick's Equip for Reading Success to support your, but you need, we need to have that teacher knowledge. We can't just go out and, and, and buy a, a structured literacy program. Structured literacy is an approach that encompasses all the different areas. And you might be able to pull in resources and programs to support some of those different areas, but it is not, uh, there's no one-stop shop. Yeah, I imagine also um, just echoing some of what you're talking about in, in relation to nuances, you know, working with specifically second language learners. So, you know, programs that require those differences of nuances would be probably challenging to come across. Um, we have a question here from Elizabeth about the main differences between the two books that you recommended. Well, I'll be honest, I haven't finished the um, focus on reading yet. So I can't finish that. It, it, I'm going to read it on the plane tomorrow, because I was afraid someone's going to ask me that question at the conference on Saturday. I was like, I'm going to read it on the plane. But I have read the um, one by Elsa Cardenas Hagen. And um, I really like that one because it provides practical applications in the classroom. Um, e easy to read. It's It's not um, it's not a heavy read. It's very practical. So I would recommend that one. I'm hearing that we should have a symposium book club for next year. <laughs> yes. Oh my gosh. I've done three book clubs, one for my district, one for the teachers in my school, and then one for uh, decoding dyslexia for the parents, because I want parents to be reading some of these books too, so that they can start advocating for it. So yes. But books take a long time to read. So I actually just started a podcast club and podcasts are an equally great way to learn about the science of reading um, in just 45 minutes. Yeah, and you've got some great references there in, in your slides that we'll share with folks with, in relation to podcasts. Um, okay, it seems like that's all we have um, uh, unless there's a last question coming through. Okay, we've got one more. Okay, how do you address the e in bead versus the R in bread? Ooh, good question. So I, oh, I'm still on a uh, slide share. Sorry. There is a course here. I'm just going to go back. It's called the basics of phonics and decoding. It is the most cost effective course you will ever take and it is going to blow your mind. The basics of phonics and decoding. First of all, it's anything but basic. So the title's misleading because it's not basic. It explains the rules. Why does the word knight, as in the knight in shining armor, start with a K? It talks about why um, EA has three different sounds and when do you use, um, how do you know when to use those, uh, those vowel teams for certain words? And they, they give you some great sentences. And the one for EA, I don't, I'm afraid I didn't read the whole question, but they give you a sentence and the sentence is eating bread is great. And so the word eating, E-A, 
has the highest frequency for the long E sound. So EA most frequently says the long E sound, eating bread. The second highest frequency for EA is E, as in bread in red, I read the book, and great. So less frequently, only 10% of the time, the EA says, oh yes, you can unmute. Oh, I'm still listening. I, I might have a follow-up question, but I'll finish hearing you out. Thank you. Well, so in the basics of phonics and decoding course, they tell you the percentage of time that those vowel teams say a certain sound like moon and book. There's another example. Double O doesn't just say ooh, it says uh, like look and book. And um so all of those things that we tell students, well, it's just crazy. English is just crazy. The basics of phonics and spelling course takes the crazy out of learning English. Okay, yeah, that makes sense. Which of these resources did you say shows the percentage of the time that, um, like for example, EA would use a long E sound? So the sent, um, so the basics of phonics and decoding course, it's 65 okay. Canadian dollars, which is about, I think, $10 your currency. No, just kidding. Um, it's probably about $50 your currency, but um, it is truly the, the meat and potatoes of teaching phonics. Okay. And as a follow-up to that question, um, you know, you know that that um, rule that's taught, like the two vowels go walking, the first one does a talking, like with the long vowel sounds pretty much right. Um, so most of the time, those are the sounds, right? So it's okay to like share that, but mention like there will be, you know, there will be other sounds, <laughs> or like there will be cases where this doesn't work. Like that's not, because um, I've heard that from some people um, online that that two vowels go walking rule can really mess up the reading, but I found it to be very useful. Yeah, I mean, if it's if it's useful and working for your students, yes. Um, I often uh, try to refrain from saying, oh, that's just an exception to the rule. It's reading English is crazy because often we say that when we don't know the rule ourselves. And mm -hmm. English is actually a very rule-based language, but we're often saying, oh, it's just crazy because we actually don't know the rules ourselves. Yeah, it feels like a lot of exceptions. Okay, thank mm -hmm. you. And I'm, I'm, I'm like, I'm not a teacher. I'm homeschooling. Good for you. I did it for, I don't know, four months when we had school closures and I am not cut out to homeschool my own children. <laughs> Full on homeschooling, not, not the like virtual. Um, Good for you. Study, but yeah. I highly well recommend. Thank you. I highly recommend the basics of phonics and spelling course then. Okay. All right. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you for that question, Elizabeth, and, and for the follow up. Um, I will probably um, take us to the final steps here. Um, I just want to make sure that we do get time. We're about to drop the survey to the, um, uh, the link to the survey in the chat box. Please do take a moment to make sure you take some time to go through that. That's how we can come up with um, programming once we know where your interests and, and, um, and uh, questions might be, please do take the time to go through that survey. I also want to um, remind folks that we will be sharing uh, these slides and resources um, uh, with everyone after this session. So take a, uh, make, make sure you keep a lookout um, through your inboxes to make sure that you get that information. Um, we'll be also sharing a couple of two other links um, in relation to the um, other pre-symposium sessions. Um, tomorrow we have our Right to Read um, private film screening. Please, uh, if you're already uh, registered for the symposium, you will have information about that. You can find additional information through that link. And finally, we have our virtual in-conversation session uh, on Friday, the day before the symposium, and that in conversation is with Lakeisha Young and Karen D'Souza. So make sure you take a look at the, that registration information. And finally, um, I want to say a huge thank you to Kim. Um, thank you so much for making the time to share your expertise um, with us all. We're really, really excited. I haven't met you in person, so I'm looking forward to doing that on Saturday. Um, so please do make sure, folks, that you um, get all the information about the uh, Literacy and Justice for All Symposium to make sure that you can 
join us uh, through the week and more specifically on Saturday. Um, okay, and I believe that's probably where we'll uh, leave everything. Thank you. Thank you for joining us, everyone. Thank you, everyone. See you Saturday.